With the firing on Fort Sumter, the secession crisis escalated into a bloody conflict. Weeks of work to mend sectional relations in Congress had failed. Secretary of State William H. Seward had been a driving force trying to prevent sectional conflict. But the outbreak of hostilities meant he fell in line and supported the administration's war effort. By late April, Seward was given one last opportunity to bring about peace. This video will look at the April 1861 peace mission to Richmond. Even after the first shots at Fort Sumter and the violence in Baltimore, Seward remained interested in preserving the Union, and Bremen's minister resident, Rudolf Schleiden, offered him an opportunity to do so. The violence in Baltimore had a deep impact on Schleiden, who had a humanitarian, even pacifist streak in him. In response to the foreseeable bloodshed, he contemplated mediating a truce between the two belligerents. As a former revolutionary, Schleiden approved of the right to revolution, but Schleiden did not grant the South that right. He believed that Southerners had acted preemptively, or as he often termed it, on sudden impulses. Furthermore, Schleiden knew from his experiences how difficult it was for a state to survive against a larger, more powerful foe. The idea of the diplomatic corps mediating was not new. In early January, Edward Everett approached the British minister, Lord Lyons, to inquire whether Great Britain, France, or Russia could mediate the sectional differences. Nothing came of the idea. In March and April, foreign representatives in Washington were active trying to find some reconciliation between the two sides. Schleiden's attempt to mediate a truce was only one of many ideas that circulated in Washington that spring. On the morning of April 24, 1861, Schleiden heard that Vice President Alexander Stevens was in Richmond. Knowing Stevens from his time in Congress, when the two had resided in the same house, Schleiden secretly broached his idea to mediate a truce to both Salmon P. Chase and Seward. Where Chase refused to make any comment, Seward responded favorably, but with reservations. Schleiden's concern to prevent bloodshed received Seward's support, and he reassured the minister that making contact with Stevens would not be held against Schleiden. However, Seward cautioned that the president and the government could not authorize such negotiations or provide specific terms. Nevertheless, Seward suggested that Schleiden should talk to President Lincoln. That afternoon, Seward and Schleiden met with Lincoln. The president thanked Schleiden for his willingness to help prevent bloodshed. He expressed a certain regret that he could no longer claim ignorance and wished that Schleiden had gone to Richmond on his own. Schleiden countered that it would have been wrong for him to do so, 
and would have exposed him to accusations of conspiring with the enemy against the only legitimate government. Schleiden was painfully aware of why he was in Washington and not at home in Schleswig-Holstein. His role as an insurgent had made him an outcast once, but there was no need to become one for a cause Schleiden did not believe in. Worried about the press misinterpreting his intentions, Lincoln insisted that the conversation be kept confidential. Despite his unwillingness to authorize negotiations, Lincoln promised that he would consider, with equal respect and care, all propositions that he would receive. Schleiden left the meeting with the impression that Seward and Lincoln wished for him, without official authorization, to consult with Stevens. On the way to Richmond, Schleiden noticed that his mission was unlikely to succeed. Throngs of young people filled the railroad stations, eager to fight. The newspapers contained a belligerent tone. Richmond itself resembled an army camp. In the lobby of Richmond's Spotswood Hotel, Schleiden found Senator Hunter and a few other prominent Virginians anxious to inquire about the reason for his journey. Schleiden immediately contacted Stevens, and the two had a three-hour-long conversation. Favorably inclined, Stevens doubted the prospects for success. Reminding Schleiden of the treatment the Southern Commissioners had received in Washington, Stevens argued that Seward's peacefulness could be easily discredited. Recent developments increased Southern mistrust, according to Stevens. To him, Maryland had seceded by the actions of the mob in Baltimore, and the rebellion was honor-bound to come to the state's assistance if requested, which made the Potomac as a boundary unacceptable. Thus one aspect of the ceasefire had to be either Maryland's inclusion in the rebellion, or the end of troop movements through the state. In addition, the government could not risk demoralizing the people with a ceasefire. Finally, Stevens had no authority to negotiate. Nevertheless, Stevens decided to think about the offer. Schleiden requested a formal written statement. With the formal statement as basis, Stevens and Schleiden debated for another two hours during which Schleiden impressed upon Stevens the need to modify passages. At the end of their conversation, both agreed to keep their talks confidential. Schleiden had lost face and did not even record his second conversations with Stevens in his diary. Schleiden returned to Washington on April 27. He immediately copied the proposal and correspondence and added a cover letter which he personally delivered to Seward. Seward listened attentively to the verbal report. He answered in Lincoln's stead, thanking Schleiden for his efforts. Seward confirmed that the Union was supreme and that the restoration of the Union was the primary goal of the government. Lincoln saw no use to pursue this matter any further. Schleiden informed Stevens of the failure. The trip to Richmond shows Seward's continued interest in using any means at his disposal to stall hostilities and allow Unionists time to regain control in the southern states. Even by late April 1861, Seward was still under the assumption of strong Unionist sentiments in the South. However, there is no evidence that Seward was the instigator or that he directly provided Schleiden with terms and conditions to present to the rebel vice president. Schleiden's trip in late April, one month into the war, illustrates a continued desire to find a peaceful solution. 